So, Bismillah uh, ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. For those of you that are online, can you hear me? Just want to make sure that everybody can hear me, inshallah. Uh, those of you that are online can hear me, right? Okay, good, inshallah. <coughs> So, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, ahbaduhu wa usalli ala rasulil kareem, amma ba'd. Faqala azza wa jal, iyaka na'budu wa iyaka nasta'in, rabbi shahli sadri wa yasirli amri, wahlul uqadata min lisani yafkahu qawli. Ameen, Allahumma ameen, ya Rabbi. So, uh, let me just review parts of what we talked about last time very quickly, and then continue, inshallah, in what we're supposed to uh, try to cover um, today. So last time I said that every time there is an interaction, uh, this interaction, we call it bidding, right? So every interaction you have with your spouse uh, is a request. So somebody says, uh, hand me the envelope, or somebody says, can I have water? Or somebody says, any request is a bidding. And either a bidding will get, thank you, either the bidding will get accepted or rejected, or a person will withdraw from that bidding. Uh, and the more frequent you have a positive bidding, so for example, uh, somebody is driving and they see a barn and uh, they say, Hey, honey, look at that barn. That's just like the barn we used to be in when we were small. And uh, and the wife is like, uh, I'm busy doing my reading my newspaper. Don't talk to me. So that's a rejection, right? Or she could be like, yeah, that's like, I remember that. That's just like that. Or she can choose to say nothing. Um, every interaction you have, is a is a bidding that's like the atomic particles of the relationship now today we're going to try to get into the subatomic particles which is what's under the bidding which is uh cognitive slash emotional aspects which we'll get to in a little bit but you can't hear okay um let me see oh do we have a speaker thing here Oh, okay. there you go. <clears throat> Subhanallah. Okay. Yeah, I think that'll work. Uh, yeah, that's fine. If there's a need, I can come closer. Okay. Um, oh, I think something happened to the uh, project. Oh, okay, now it's okay. Um, all right. So every time there's an interaction between a husband and wife, that's called bidding. Now let's move forward from there. And I want to give you some examples of conversations that uh, can happen between husbands and wives. And this will be part of your homework to see which one of these four things do you do. Now, these are the four things that uh, some people consider the four killers of a marriage. Okay. And so what are the four killers of a marriage? Let's talk about these four very quickly, and then let's look at some examples. The first one is escalation. Uh, that is, uh, you escalate. So this is when arguments turn into a war of words. A comment or criticism is received defensively, setting off an increasing spiral of defensive slash blame and accusations against the other. Each round of interaction ups the ante. So maybe the tone will start to go up, right? So things get worse and worse. Each person perceives them or herself as right and the other partner as wrong. And their agenda becomes about winning the argument 
but to the, de uh, the detriment of their goodwill and friendly feelings. One of the most damaging things is that partners say things in the heat of the moment that they don't really mean and people are hurt. Once negative comments are made, they can't be taken back. For some couples, escalation is subtle. They don't want to fight. They, want, they avoid uh, confrontation. So the escalation is happening. Sometimes what happens is the with, instead of escalation increasing, the withdrawal increases between the partners. So escalation is subtle. Voices may not be raised, but the negative to negative interaction is real nonetheless. So, so for example, some people will escalate by not, not talking, uh, going in the other direction. But even low level criticism, and low level criticism is instead of saying you're bad, you might phrase it in the form of a question. I didn't expect you to do that. Where the other person understands or takes the intended statement in a certain way. And defensiveness are destructive over time. The more they occur and escalate, the greater the couple is at risk of future problems as they gradually erode friendship and goodwill. <clears throat> so this is one of the four killers, okay? Invalidation is another very, very important one. This is a, a pattern in which one partner puts down the thoughts, the feelings, or character of the other. The put down may be subtle. Like it's not so bad as a spouse is talking about an upsetting event. Or it may be more explicit, you're crazy. Basically denying how a person is feeling. That's invalidation. Long-term effective invalidation is to lower self-esteem, create resentment in, target, in the targeted spouse. Invalidation can take many forms, criticism, sarcasm, contempt, name-calling, nonverbal looks of disgust, or even ignoring another. Whatever the form, it hurts and leads to covering up who you are and what you think and feel. It's too risky to do otherwise. So the first one was escalation. Is your conversations escalating? And number two, invalidation. Now, everyone tends to do all four of these from time to time, but the couples that catch on to that's what they're doing, I'm escalating, I need to de-escalate or I'm invalidating him or her, and I need to start validating. Like the sooner and the quicker you catch on to how you're eroding the relationship, uh, the better, the better that couple is. Withdrawing is in, in this pattern, one spouse plays the role, role of pursuer. This is very, very common. Usually the pursuer is the female. She's the one who sees the problem. She's the one who pursues the man and tries to get him to talk about the problem. And the man or the one being pursued tries to avoid. Sometimes it's the other way around. Most of the time it's the women that are pursuing and men that are trying to avoid the confrontation. In this pattern, one spouse plays the role of pursuer by bringing up issues and trying to get a discussion or a decision. The other spouse plays the role of the withdrawer by either avoiding discussions or shutting down. Stonewalling. Stonewalling is actually a form of abuse where you don't want to talk about the issues at all. And not talking to the spouse for days or weeks is actually very, um, it's like one of the major things. Withdrawing may be turning, uh, tuning out, getting quiet, refusing to talk, leaving the room, or even agreeing with what is being asked just to end the conversation. This pattern becomes negative reinforcing cycle. This is when couples will say to you, I know exactly how we're gonna fight. I know how exactly the fight will end. And it becomes like, uh, there's a book called The Games We Play. So it's kind of like, yeah, it's like games we play. This pattern becomes negative reinforcing cycle. The more the pursuer push pushes, the more withdrawal retreats, causing the pursuer to push more and the withdrawal to withdraw further. So it is important if you're caught in this pattern to realize you're interdependent. What each of you does promotes the very thing you dread from your partner. So it is, it can be helpful for pursuers to learn to back off a bit 
and withdrawers to, are willing to deal more directly with the issues at hand. So we're going to deal with number three in a lot of details over the next few classes. Negative interpretations. So an example of negative interpretation could be that um, you know the the wife is putting up a picture. The husband says to her, "Can I help you?" And the wife thinks to herself, "Oh, he thinks I can't do anything." Right? It's the interpretation that you're giving to what is being said. So a husband and wife are sitting at a restaurant. Uh, the husband says, I want to order a steak. I'm just giving textbook examples, not Islamic necessarily examples, but the husband says, I want a steak. The wife says, oh, you're going to have a steak again. Uh, you, you know, like being sarcastic that he shouldn't because the doctor said otherwise. This is when one spouse constantly believes the motives of his or her spouse are more negative than they really are. He or she looks at everything, even good things, through a negative filter. These interpretations become cemented into the fabric of their relationship. Over time, the pattern demoralizes the more positive spouse. Negative interpretations are deconstructive, in part because they're hard to detect and counteract. The reason is a confirmation bias. See, I told you she always does that. Or I told you he always does that, which means we tend to interpret events in terms of our preconceived beliefs. What helps, however, is for the spouse with the negative interpretation to learn to hold their perceptions more tentatively, not as truth, but a point of view. We'll talk more about this. If, if this is you, look for evidence that contradicts what you're being you've been telling yourself. Basically, the way to do that is to see if you're talking negatively to yourself. That's like one big aspect of this. It also helps if the other partner can really hear their, their partner out or let them fully explore their point of view before challenging them. People are much more likely to be influenced if they know someone understands what they're saying. And that is something we're going to talk a lot about. But now let me go into some examples of these conversations. So husband and wife talking to each other. Uh, the wife says, you'd think you could put the cap back on the toothpaste. Husband replies, oh, like you never forget to put it back on. The wife says, as a matter of fact, I always put it back on. Oh, I forgot just how compulsive you are. You're right, of course. She says, I don't even know why I stay with you. You're so negative. So what is happening here? Uh, the, the bidding is going negative, 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 right? So sh she made a request in the beginning. You'd think you'd put, you could put the cap back on the toothpaste. That was actually a bid, a request, but maybe put in a negative way. But he returned the negative bid with a negative response. And then from there, it escalated. Now, these things happen in every couple. But the main thing is that good couples or couples that are have a healthy relationship, they recognize these patterns before it becomes too late. So right in the middle of this, somebody might say, OK, I'm sorry, I won't do it next time. Right. So you you so. What should have happened here is that when she made a request, instead of reacting to that, oh, like you never forget to put it back on, uh, he could have said something more positive or acknowledged her feelings that, yeah, when I leave it, when I don't put the cap back on, I know that it bothers you, so I'll try to do better next time. Okay, let's look at some more examples. <clears throat> Did you get the rent paid on time? This is the type of interaction that happens when a couple are not talking as much, so things aren't clear. Uh, did you get the rent paid on time? And uh, let's say in this case, it's the wife. The wife says, that was going to be your job. And he says, no, you were supposed to do it. And she says, no, you were. And then he says, did it get done? Uh, no, I'm not going to do it either. Great, just great, right? So these are the types of interactions that 
uh, once you start on, it's like once you go one degree negative, it's almost taking you to a hopeful conversation of like a negative in the negative direction. And so it's important to be cognizant of how you're responding to one another. Now, what's under these conversations, right? These conversations that are taking place, what is under them is your emotions and your cognition, which we're going to talk about another time. Now, if anybody remembers the five stages of marriage, who remembers what's the first stage of marriage? Uh, enchantment, right? Now, when you're in the enchantment phase, one of the things that's uh, we're going to really, I think uh, I might go into this, but one of the things we're really going to study is language and the pronouns, which is that when you're in the enchantment phase, everything is we, 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 right? Me and you and we. And as we go from the disenchantment phase to the, uh, you know, uh, the in, in, in enchantment phase to being disenchanted, like your, your, your expectations are broken, your conversation goes from we are a, like we are a team to you didn't do this or I this. So it goes from we language to I language. Okay. We, we might look at that at some point. Uh, okay, let's look at the next one. Oh, so what are the uh, things that happen as things are escalating? Uh, criticism, sarcasm, contempt is the result of a prolonged criticism and prolonged sarcasm, where now you it becomes part of your belief system that your spouse is not doesn't have goodwill in the relationship. And it becomes contempt and contempt leads to name calling. And of course, uh, whenever they look at each other, then it escalates to nonverbal looks of disgust. And the opposite side of that is ignoring. Like when the couples are ignoring one another and not even communicating. Okay, so let's continue. So let's look at another example. You missed your doctor's appointment again. You're so irresponsible. This is a very typical statement by women to men. The irresponsible point. Uh, you're so irresponsible. I could see you dying and leaving me just like your father. The husband replies, thanks a lot. You know, I'm nothing like your father. She says he was, and by the way, these are real conversations. These are, these are taken from real um, interactions between husbands and wives, what I'm showing you here. He was irresponsible and so are you. Uh, he says, I'm sorry, I forgot my good fortune to be married to such a paragon of responsibility. You can't even keep your purse organized. So the husband says that. And then she says, at least I'm not so obsessive. And he says, you're just arrogant. How should the conversation go? It should go into a point of uh, validation. And the point of validation is that you are not arguing with them, but you're trying to look at the, emo the underlying emotions of that particular uh, situation. So let's look at this example now. I'm really mad you missed the doctor's appointment again. I'm worried about you being around with me in the future. He says, is it, it really upsets you, did, did, doesn't it? So now he's acknowledging her feelings. You bet. I want to know that you're going to be here for me. And when you miss an appointment that I'm anxious about it, I worry about us. He says, I understand why it would make you worried when I don't take care of myself. So this is the opposite of, uh, so what's the what's the difference between the first case of conversation and the and the and the second, right? You missed the doctor's appointment again. You're so irresponsible. So look at the criticism, right? Uh, the the wife is speaking in a way that doesn't allow him easily to validate her feelings, and then he is then escalating the confrontation between the husband and the wife. You missed your doctor's appointment again. 
You're so irresponsible. I could see you dying and leaving me just like your father. And then he responds, thanks a lot. You know, I'm nothing like your father. Being defensive, that's defensive. He was irresponsible and so are you. Okay, and so the argument continues. How should the wordings be framed? They should be framed on both sides that allows validation. And usually uh, it's about talking about how you feel. So in this second case, I am really mad that you missed the doctor's appointment again, right? It's about not you're irresponsible. It's about how this event made me feel. So I'm really mad that you missed the doctor's appointment again. I worry, so it's my feelings, right? I worry about you being around with me in the future. And then now he acknowledges her and says, it's re it really upsets you, didn't it? So he realizes, okay, wait. She's really upset because of this. And he's validating the feelings. You bet. I want to know. And so now because he said, because now he acknowledged her feelings, what happens? That allows now her to open up and to have a continue the positive uh, conversation. You bet. I want to know that you're going to be here for me. And when you miss an appointment, I'm anxious about I worry about uh, about us. I understand why it would make you worried when I don't take care of myself. So we see, uh, you know, escalation here. And uh, then let's look at the next one. Here's a, an example of when interpretation uh, is negative. Okay, it's a very typical example, actually. This, this type of interpretation, especially, you know, because of... It, I mean, what's interesting is that uh, the, the in-laws usually become a good place of misinterpretation of a lot of things, right? Uh, so you'll see this example here now. Uh, we should start looking into plane tickets to go visit my parents this holiday. That's the wife. I was wondering if we can really afford it this year, says the husband. My parents are very important to me, even if you don't like them. I'm going to go. He says, I'd like to go. I really would. I just don't see how we can afford $1,000 in plane tickets and pay for the bill of Joy's orthodontist too. You can't be honest and admit you just don't want to go, can you? You don't like my parents. There's nothing to admit. I enjoy visiting your parents. I'm thinking about money here and not your parents. That's a convenient excuse, she says. So this is an example of misinterpretation, right? And so this happens, by the way, you reach this stage of misinterpretation after a long period of, uh, of escalation and negative conversations. Okay, here's another example of uh, escalation and uh, also misinterpretation. You left out the car again. The husband says, oh, I guess I forgot to put it in when I came back from uh, this person's house. Magis. I guess you did. Uh, you, know, you know how much that irritates me. Look, I forgot. Do you think I leave it out just to irritate you? She says, actually, that's exactly what I think. You would have told, I would have told you so many times that I want the car in the garage at night. I think me and me have had this fight. Yes, you have, but I don't leave it out to tick you off. I just forgot. She says, if you cared, what I thought, uh, what I thought about things, you'd remember. He says, "You know that I put the car in nine times out of ten. She says, "More like half the time, and those are the times I leave the garage door open for you." He says, "Have it your way. It doesn't matter what is what really reality is. You'll see it your way anyway. Okay. So now, <clears throat> Negative interpretations 
are destructive in part because they're hard to detect and counteract because of bias confirmation. Um, spouse with negative interpretation learn to hold their perceptions uh, as real, okay? It also helps if the other partner can really hear their partner out or let them fully explore their point of view. So what should happen, and so now let me actually go into uh, some of the things that can be done, is here are the rules, okay, of conversation or engagement between the spouses. Number one, you have to start with the assumption that your partner is telling the truth, that that's exactly how they feel. Because if not doing that allows a no starter. So you have to come from the point of view, okay, this is the ex what you see or what we see as an excuse is not an excuse. That's how they feel. If they said they forgot, that means that they forgot, not that they did it on purpose. So what is important is for every day, for example, I'm giving like one template. Every day before you go to sleep, you say to your, each other, do we have any issues between us? And then you let them, you let the spouses talk about their issues. When the spouse talks to you about the issues, about how they felt, it's very important not to get into the mode of who is right and who is wrong. It is important to stay in the mode of, this is how I feel. And for the other person to acknowledge, that's how you feel. And you work your way and your negotiation like that. But there is something very important here, is that once somebody gives their word to do something, it is very important to try to keep that word in, in a relationship. Because... That is like the most important thing in a relationship is keeping your word. So if you're, if you're able to acknowledge each other's feelings without going to who's right and who's wrong, and if you're able to negotiate agreements with each other, then you can move into even from a negative territory towards a more positive territory, okay? Okay, let's go back. Okay. Happy and stable couples are able to recognize the pattern and more quickly steer out of it. Meaning a husband is able to recognize, wait, I, wait I'm wait, i withdrawing from her and not talking to her when I should be talking to her. Or he realizes, wait, our tone is escalating. We need to, or she realizes our tone is escalating and we need to bring it down. Uh, or to recognize, wait, maybe I'm interpreting this the wrong way. And maybe I, I need to accept what he or she is saying as that is exactly the case instead of doing a negative interpretation. So, um, yeah. Invalidation, uh, that is when you don't accept other people's feelings, right? So invalidation, this is a pattern in which one partner puts down the thoughts, feelings, or character of the other. Subtle, it's not so bad. Uh, like, uh, we'll, I'll give you an example of that in a little bit. Or explicitly, you're crazy. So here's an example of something subtle. Where the husband may say something thinking that he's doing something good, but he's actually not communicating properly. So let's look at this example. You know, I'm really frustrated by the hatchet job Bob did on my evaluation at work. So this is the wife complaining that she was at work and her evaluation was not as good as she thought. The husband says in order to please her, but it's a wrong step. I don't think he was all that critical. I'd be happy to have an evaluation like that from my boss. She says, you don't get it. It upset me. Yeah, I see that, but I think you're overreacting. So again, instead of validating the feelings, which should have been more like, uh, so invalidation prevents closeness and intimacy because then she will feel he's not getting me and he's not understanding me. And if you remember the first class we had, 
we said, what's the most important feeling that a wife needs to have is that he gets me, right? And the most important feeling for the husband is that she respects me. So partners begin hiding themselves from each other because they don't want to feel hurt. Like he doesn't even get me, right? So for wives, that's a big deal. The way to prevent invalidation is to show respect and acknowledge your partner's feelings, even if you think acknowledging them will hurt her. That is key. So if you now look at this uh, conversation, you know I'm really frustrated that the hatchet job job Bob did on my evaluation at work. And then he says, instead of saying, oh, no, don't worry about it. You're overreacting. It was great. You know, all that, which men would tend to do, right? He says, in this case, that must really tick you off. You're angry. And so now he is participating in her anger with her. And now she feels that he gets me. Yeah, it does. And I also get worried about whether I'll be able to keep the job. Now, see, in the first conversation, if you notice, she didn't open up to him further. What was really behind that evaluation was her fear for what? Losing the job. But because they didn't connect emotionally, he didn't get that information, even though he had good intentions. So, you know, I'm really frustrated about that hatchet job Bob did on my evaluation at work. And then he says, that must really tick you off. He is now, instead of calming her down, he's actually participating in agreeing with the fact that she is, her feelings are, her, her, her anger is a valid feeling. Yeah, it does. And it also, I get worried that whether if I'll be able to keep this job or not. I don't know if you were so, I didn't know you were so worried about losing this job. Tell me more about how you are feeling. So. <clears throat> this is a good example of what happens when the spouses validate each other's feelings. What happens then they actually open up to the next part of their feelings. Like, why were they feeling this way? What led to that feeling? So in this case, it was the evaluation, but behind the evaluation, it was the idea that if I, I get a negative evaluation at work, well, I might lose my job. In the first case, even though he had good intentions and was saying, oh, don't worry, you're overreacting, you're fine. It's not that bad of an evaluation. But that didn't allow her then to open up to her. And vice versa can also be true. Withdrawing or avoidance. One spouse plays the role of pursuer. This is usually the wife who wants to, uh, quote unquote, argue or pursue or to communicate or to... Wives feel like their points are not understood by the husband. The reason the wives feel that way is because they don't feel that validation. So they have to say the same thing a hundred times that like as if they're going to hammer it into the guy and he's one day going to get the point. Withdrawing or avoid avoidance. One spouse plays the role of pursuer. The other spouse plays the role of withdrawer. What does he do? tuning you out, meaning you're talking to him, but he's not really listening. Getting quiet and refusing to talk, leaving the room or simply agreeing to whatever is being said. And then sh she thinks, oh, you agreed to this. So now why are you not doing it? And that is a sign that a real conversation actually never took place. So that is an issue. Here's another example. Uh, I love Tanya. There's no problem here. Tanya, I think, is the daughter, if I remember correctly. You have to get some help, the wife says. You can't stick your head in the sand. I think the conversation uh, starts from here, actually. When are you going to talk about how you've been handling your anger? The wife says this. Can't this wait? I'm going to get my taxes done right now. She says, you brought this up. At, I brought this up at least five times already. No, it can't wait. He says, what's to talk about anyway? It's none of your business. She says, Tanya is my business. I'm afraid that you may lose your temper and hurt her and you won't do a darn thing to learn to deal with your anger. 
He says, I love Tanya. There is no problem here. She says, you have to get help. You can't stick your head in the sand. He says, I'm not going to discuss anything with you when you are like this. She says, like what? Does it, it doesn't even matter if I'm calm or frustrated. You won't talk to me about anything important. Tanya is having problems and you have to face that. Or yes, he's quiet. Well, and he says, I'm going to out and get a drink and have some peace and quiet. Talk to me now. I'm tired of you leaving me alone when you're talking about when we're talking about something important. He says, I'm not talking. I'm, I'm not talking. You are actually, in fact, you're yelling. See you later. So this is an example of a very high level of escalation where uh, they're not able to communicate and the person is withdrawing from communicating and talking at all. This is probably happens after a long time in the marriage, in the first stage of marriage where there's enchantment. Uh, you know, everything is we and we're a team and everything is together and we have a problem. And then this is now the phase where it's you are the problem. And so how should have she, uh, how could have they had a better conversation here is, is the question, right? Negative interpretation. One spouse constantly believes the motives of his or her spouse are more negative than they actually are. So again, this negative interpretation requires people to sit down and actually analyze, are my thoughts negative? To actually sit down with the spouse and have a conversation about what they feel. And then to have those feelings challenged by the spouse after listening to him or her out. All right, here's another example. Uh, I think we did this, right? Yeah, we did this one. All right, so now let's go on to the next thing, which is over here. Now, the Gottmans are very important uh, when it comes to research in marriage. And that is because they're the simply most cited people when it comes to marriage in the entire academic uh, literature, in all the journals. Their research is the most cited one, okay? And uh, so there are the four horsemen of the apocalypse in relationships and how to stop them when they're, when they're antidotes. So what are the four things the, uh, the Gottman Institute uh, has come up with after their research, which is one of the most extensive researches in relationships? They say that when a relationship has these four things, then it is a 90% chance that there's going to be a divorce, okay? And so Gottman is known to be able to more than 90% predict if a couple's gonna get divorced or not. This is what he's, this was what he, his forte was, is that a couple can come to me and I'll be able to tell you if they'll survive this marriage or not. And his criteria was based upon these four things which are number one, criticism, contempt, defensiveness, and stonewalling. Criticism meaning verbally attacking the personality or character of a person, meaning the spouse, right? So you have to ask yourself sitting in this class, okay, am I doing this? Is my spouse doing this? How can we reduce this? How can we change from criticism and, 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 and not go there? Number two is contempt. Contempt actually happens after... Uh, a long period of sarcasm and a long period of criticism, then it becomes a belief system. And in that belief system, you have an immediate contempt for your spouse. So contempt attacking the sense of, of self with an intent to hurt or abuse or to insult the person, okay? Uh, defensiveness, victimizing yourself is to ward off a perceived attack and reverse the blame. You're always doing this, or you're always yelling at me, or you're always et cetera, et cetera, right? That's, or every time if she brings up a concern, you take a defensive position. Uh, you, she said to you, why did you forget uh, my child at the masjid? And you say, well, uh, you know, it's the first time this happened. 
or something, like some defensive statement. Stonewalling is when you withdraw from the conflict, you avoid the conflict, you don't want to talk to her. Usually it's the guys. Sometimes it's the wives too that will not talk for days or weeks or they don't want to talk about the subject. Withdrawing is to avoid conflict and convey disapproval, distance, and separation. Okay, so now let's go back to the beginning of this chart. So instead of criticism, a try a gentle startup. Now, I will say that generally uh, wives today and, and brother and, and, the, and the husbands, they're not as diplomatic as they used to be. Uh, what do I mean by that? I mean that long time ago, if you read the books of advice, both in the Western culture, like if you pick up the advice books of the 1800s or in the Muslim world, in the non-Muslim world, you, very often one of the patterns you find across the world at that time was that the mothers would advise their children that when you talk to your husband, be mindful of the, uh, the, the, um, the time and the place. Right. So nowadays it is more likely and I'm not putting blame here. I'm just simply saying these are the patterns that we've gotten into as a collective society. So the husband comes from work and boom, the wife is like, OK, uh, you didn't do this and you didn't do that. I'm not saying everybody does that, but it tends to happen compared to in the 1700s. There was uh, women were taught to be a little bit more diplomatic. And I think that takes the relationship a long way on the side of the women. So instead of criticism, gentle startup. And I would say, based upon some of these findings, that gentle startup also means your timing. Is, you know, they say in politics, timing is everything. And in some ways, in marriage, also timing is everything, right? So gentle startup, talk about your feelings using I statements and express a positive need. Oh, yeah, I wanted to bring this up. Let me see if I have it uh, with me here. I don't have it with me today here. It's okay. We'll do it next time. So <clears throat> what is the first phase of marriage? Uh, who remembers what's the first phase of marriage? Uh, it, it's what? Enchantment, right? So I was saying when you're in the en enchantment phase, what happens? Your conversation is more what? We. Now I'm going to tell you a second thing. Is that when you are in the we phase, uh, what is happening to your needs? No, they're being met, right? And then what happens? You find out your needs are what? Not being met. And that's when you get into the, just. that's when your expectations are broken. And you're like, wait, I got into marriage for this, right? This is not all that exciting. And in fact, that's one of the uh, big criticisms of marriage that people feel is that I'm bored in my marriage. And uh, we could talk about boredom and what that leads to uh, and maybe a little bit if we have time. But OK, so instead of criticizing, if you say how you're feeling. Instead of saying you're so lazy. Uh, which is a common thing wives say to husbands. Uh, and then instead of that, say something like I feel like I, I would like if we can go to the gym today. I'm just saying. Okay. All right. So the second one is contempt, attacking the sense of self with an intent to insult or abuse. Uh, build a culture of appreciation. This is actually very, very important. And I'll tell you something that I wrote here uh, from the Gottman Institute. Um, I wanted to uh, talk about this. There is a habit of mind that masters have. Masters, he means couples that are master couples, right? Gottman explained in an interview, which is this. People that are good couples, what do they do? They're scanning the social environments for things that they can appreciate and say thank you for. 
they are building this culture of respect and appreciation very purposefully. The disasters that uh, disasters are scanning, meaning people that are disasters in marriage, they're scanning the social environment for partners' mistakes. You didn't do this, you didn't do this, and you didn't do this. And no one's talking about what was done. Nobody is saying thank you. Uh, if you remember the hadith of the Prophet, bikufrihinna, ba'ula tahunna, not being thankful to the husband. In this case, you know that particular narration. It's not just scanning environment, chimed in Julie Gottman, her, his wife, who's doing research with him. It's scanning the partner for what the partner is doing right or scanning, scanning him for what he's doing wrong versus uh, wrong and criticizing versus respecting him and expressing appreciation. So when you're looking at your home, your field of environment, are you looking at your spouse from the perspective of, okay, what is the positive thing we can start with? Or are you looking to criticize, right? So this is, without this, there's no stepping stone to move forward, right? You have to have something positive to be able to nudge things forward. And then a lot of times people will be like, well, you know, I can, uh, you know, I want to improve. Uh, and, and as long as one spouse is willing to help the marriage, uh, the marriage can be helped for this reason. That as long as one spouse changes or brings in more positivity, then that will overall change the trajectory of the whole relationship. Okay. So now let's go to uh, defensiveness. Instead of victimizing yourself, what is the most important thing to do? Take responsibility. If the husband or the wife is not taking responsibility, then that's a discussion the two need to have. I don't think you're being responsible. Usually wives will say a whole bunch of things without having this conversation. So it is important that you say in the proper way at the proper time, accept your partner's perspective and offer an apology for any wrongdoing and take responsibility if it's one way. But then if you want to have a conversation, if that's what you're feeling like, then you should bring that up to your partner, not criticizing them, not showing contempt or withdrawing from them because you don't like them, but having a conversation. I wish you were more responsible, but saying it at the right time. Stonewalling, withdrawing to avoid conflict and convey disapproval, distance, and separation. Instead of that, uh, physiological self-soothing, right? Uh, take a break. And spend that time doing something soothing and distracting to come back. So the purpose of withdrawal is not to not have a conversation. The purpose of withdrawing, if you do that, is to come back and have the conversation. So that's very, very important in a relationship. So let's look at <clears throat> some of this very quickly before time runs out. Uh, attack the criticism. Attack the character, question the intention of the other party, different from a complaint which focuses on behavior. Now, this is very important. Instead of labeling the person, you're such and such, it's better to talk about the obvious uh, behavior that was seen. Um, maybe I'll talk about this more later on. Address the specific behavior without blame or attacking the person. Use I statements. I feel like you took out the milk and you didn't put it back because of X, Y, Z, okay? How, why can't you do this right? Why don't, why didn't you do this? Why do you always do this? Instead of say, I know you meant well, but this is how your action impacted me going forward. It'd be a pre, it, I'd appreciate it if you could do X, Y, Z. Criticism directs attention on the person, not the problem. Whereas when you talk to each other, you should focus on the problem as a team rather than attacking the person. The other person is made powerless and is more likely to respond with defensiveness or resignation. Request signals that your needs matter and that the other party can make a positive impact. Specific requests make it easier 
for them to directly meet your needs. Remember, everything in life is about your needs, right? Like the hierarchy needs of Maslow, if any of you remember. So your needs are met in the beginning, in the first phase of marriage, and then soon after that, your needs are not met. So what is it that you really want in a marriage? You want the marriage to move in a direction where your needs are met, right? So instead of criticizing the person, if you make the proper requests, the bidding, the, the, the atomic particles of the relationship, if you move the relationship towards requests and have those discussions that I feel that we should do this, then that will move the whole relationship in a positive direction. Okay, let's continue. Criticism, stating one's complaints as a defect in one's partner's personalities, giving the partner negative trait attributions. So this is like one of the worst things that can, like I said, these are the four apoc... Uh, yes. Uh, yeah, is it time? Okay. Okay, okay. All right, let's pray, inshallah. Does anyone have any questions that are? Yes. Okay. All right. Inshallah. Assalamu alaikum, everyone. Let's pray. Inshallah.